Hey folks, so I got yet another IPS kit that we can go ahead and get checked out, get installed, see how it works. Um, so this is this is my markings on it just to remember which kit this is. Uh, but this is how it comes when you order one of these. This is from Retro Game Repair Shop. They sent it my way to check out. Uh, but it does come in this bubble wrap baggie here. Pop that open. Then in another plastic baggie. Usually the adhesive is a little bit more uh, stubborn. I've just already had this open like two or three times, three or four times, I guess, at this point. <laughs> First time just to see what kit it was. Second time to test the screen. Third time to actually test the kit. And uh, fourth time for this video here. Okay. So let's go over what it comes with. Um, first, you do get this adhesive sticky gasket. Uh, this is to stick down to the screen to hold it into the shell and to make sure that you don't get any dust inside the uh, LCD itself. You get, of course, the LCD. Uh, we get two of these clear adhesive stickers. One of them goes on the screen, one of them goes on the PCB. Sorry, just trying to organize my desk here so we can take a look at everything all laid out, all knurled out, as it were. We get these two little plastic, uh, these are laser, are they laser cut? They actually don't look laser cut. Um, I don't know what that is, but either way, these are two little bits of acrylic. Instead of sending you a 3D printed spacer for the screen, they just give you these chunks of acrylic. This one is sized for this side of the screen and then this one is sized for the bottom spacer of the screen. And you just, you center the screen within the shell that way. Um, there are new IPS ready shells that you don't need this for, but it's fantastic that they include it. You also get, looks like one, two, three bits of wire. The PCB itself, I'm going to put that right up here under all these screws from an unrelated project. And then these two ribbon cables for both 32 pin and 40 pin Game Boy Advance motherboards. Uh, so what this is, this is the new version of the uh, one chip IPS backlight kit. So if you've seen this before, this is by the exact same manufacturer, this is just the new version of it. Um, I suspect they're doing this to try and uh, reduce their defect rate to make it cheaper to manufacture because even though they are still including these custom ribbon cables, you know, you rip this by accident, this is only a few dollars to replace, whereas this is 30 to $40, you rip this. Uh, not to mention, this is the same exact part that is used in the Game Boy Advance SP version of this kit. Uh, and also, I did try this out in a video. It looks like it's going to be the same version that they're using in the Game Boy Color version of the kit. This is the exact same PCB except they cut this top portion off with the unused flat flex cable connectors for the sensors, opting instead just to have these soldered wires. And on the bottom, it looks like they took a notch out of the corner just to make it fit a little bit better in, I guess in the SP. Um, but the text on this board, two in one, like I said, I did test it out in a Game Boy Color, and I'll, I'll post a link to that video in the description. Spoiler alert, it doesn't work yet. Uh, this two in one text refers to the fact that this works in a Game Boy Advance and a Game Boy Advance SP. I suspect compatibility for Game Boy Color is coming soon, uh, and in that case, they'll probably change it to three in one. But uh, let's, uh, let, let's get on with the install. Before I get totally distracted. So we get two of these stickers here. One of them says attach, well they both say attach to the back of the screen. I'm not sure if they were supposed to give me two or if they just mean one of them goes on to the, uh, the PCB itself, but I'm going to go ahead and apply this to the screen. Just do it now, get it out of the way here. 
and the whole purpose of this sticker is just to prevent any shorts from happening on the back of the screen since this is aluminum. Now I did do another video and I'll of course link to that in the description as well but I just want to quickly point out that these new screens are actually a different technology compared to the old ones here. I'm gonna pop this out of this Game Boy Color gently carefully and uh, we'll just real quick compare the two. This one on the left here is made by a company by LG, I'm sure you've heard of them, uh, whereas the new screens that this company is shipping, one chip, are made by a company called Topoli, and you can primarily tell them apart, and again, I went over this in more detail in my video, but if you look at the ribbon cable connectors, the Topoli ones have these distinct two black dots and this lighter color on the tab itself, and if you can actually see this part, which you can't on the laminated SP lenses, but on the Game Boy Advance and Game Boy Color ones, you can see the LG screen has this like mesh material over the bottom, whereas the Topoli screen has this uh, aluminum tape material. Um, long story short, the LG screens are much higher quality in my experience. Uh, much lower defect rate. In fact, out of the box, my SP screen was defective, but I have already tested this one. It's, it's okay. <laughs> uh, but anyway, let's actually get on with the install here. I'm gonna stack all this up and put it aside. And you probably notice this does come with touch sensors. Um, we'll, we'll discuss that more later. Let's actually talk about the Game Boy Advance. Let's talk about tonight's uh, tonight's victim. So I, uh, when I was preparing for this video, I went out and searched for the Game Boy Advance that I have um, that I set aside for mods. I was thinking, oh, I might as well use my nicest one that I have because you know, I want this mod to look good. I, I always want them to look good. I didn't want to have to deal with a ratty looking piece of junk. But then I remembered that I'm using a uh, IPS ready screen anyway, so it didn't matter. And I went and grabbed this lovely boil. So I don't even know if this works. I haven't tested it. It's covered in stickers. It's kind of gross. Um, start button, there's chunks missing in it. That's nice. Look in the speaker grill. There's plenty of uh, hand cheese in there. But anyway, let's try it out. The, old, the single only thing I have done with this since I got it is I put a battery cover on it. So before we even get into the install, let's see what we're working with. Because if this doesn't work, I have yet another backup. But I'd prefer to just use this. Uh-oh. Oh, it looks like it just needs a power button clean. Or a power switch, excuse me. That's easy enough. Alright. Let's go ahead and get this bad boy torn down. Like usual, just six tri wing screws around the periphery. And then, ooh, I just threw my screwdriver. Sorry, apparently I'm lacking in that manual dexterity thing today. got the six tri-wing screws out, switch to JIS, not Phillips, JIS. And then there's one more screw in the battery compartment. And this will just pop right off, or lift right off, aside from the single screw that I didn't fully remove. Okay. It's not going to come out because there's a sticker in the hole. Um, when you're taking your Game Boy Advance apart, it's always a great idea to set aside 
a few minutes to actually clean this. And if I were using this shell, that is exactly what I would be doing. But since I'm not, I'm just going to do that later. Um, I highly recommend warm water, soap, and a toothbrush or something. You can just scrub all this down. In this particular case, you'd probably want to peel off all these stickers first. Uh, but if you do get it wet, you want to remove this battery contact. You can do it with a pair of tweezers or with a small flathead screwdriver. You just got to stick something in this slot here, bend the tab in towards the battery compartment, and then the whole metal thing should pop out here. It's getting stuck on mine, but there it goes. It's a little gross, so I'm going to set that aside. And Now once we've got the motherboard exposed, there are either two or three JIS screws, depending on how old your console is. Mine only has two. The shell is designed for three, uh, but at some point Nintendo figured they were cranking these things out in the millions. It's, they'll try and save some costs somehow. Oh my god, that is awful. Alright, well aside from that grossness and the power switch that I need to clean, this thing is actually surprisingly clean. Uh, I'm probably going to pause take a few minutes to clean this up because damn, but I don't know. Maybe I'll do that on camera. Why not? Pop the screen out. Um, like I said, I'm not using this case, so I don't actually have to do this, but since I'm going to be doing some power usage testing, I need the screen to test with. Uh, just give it a twist back and forth, and then pull it out this way. These consoles do use a sticky gasket that you do not want to reuse for this mod, but I suppose you could if you really wanted to. If yours is kind of gross, covered with um, stuff, you can actually clean these with soap and water. It'll, uh, it's not going to destroy the adhesive, but it will weaken it enough that you can just rub this stuff off. And then when it dries, air dries, by the way, it'll still be sticky enough to actually use. All right, now I'm going to set this aside, and you guys probably won't see it again because I have no mods planned for it. Oh, no, 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 you need to not do that, thank you. There you go. Okay. Cat was trying to get onto my desk. Okay. So now he's upset that I put him on the floor. Okay, so I'm going to spend a few minutes cleaning this up. If you don't care about cleaning up your Game Boy Advance, then, I don't know, skip like five, ten minutes ahead. Alright, so this thing clearly needs a new speaker. This is just an old toothbrush. It's dry. There's no clean, there's no solvents or cleaners on it. Alright, so the sound is going to be kind of shitty in my Game Boy Advance, and that's just a fact of life for the time being. Because the only other Game Boy Advance speaker that I have, I just put in my Game Boy Pocket. Oh wait, no, I have a uh, an aftermarket speaker I can use. Ta-da, one left. So the reason this speaker is as gross as it is, is uh, either it got liquid in it, or the caps have gone bad on this Game Boy Advance. Quite frankly, it's probably the caps, so I should definitely replace those, but I'm not going to be doing that today. 
I don't know if I have the right spec on hand. I don't think I do. 100 UF 4 volt. Man, that's a... I've never seen this brand used in a Game Boy Advance on this side. I don't think that's an audio cap, though. I'm pretty sure that's just power. Anywho, let's go ahead and clean this power switch up. Nothing I haven't done before. Hopefully, unlike the Game Boy Color I just did, I don't end up breaking the switch. That would be kind of shitty. There we go. Pretty sure this is one of those nasty power switches that's always going to flicker and give me trouble no matter what I do. There are some models of Game Boy that really just need a new power switch and there's not a whole lot that can be done about that. Um, well, that's not completely true. There are aftermarket power switches on the market. I, I have one on order actually to try and check out because they seem interesting. They're completely different parts, but there's a, uh, a small PCB that you solder to the circuit board, and then the new switch is soldered to that. And look at that, isn't that nice? So I always see this mentioned, and I guess I want to talk about it now that well, while I'm working on this, while we're on the subject, I've seen a lot of people think, oh, well, I could just drip isopropyl alcohol in here, or spray something in here, spray contact cleaner, and that'll that's just as good as opening the switch and, and actually cleaning it. No, it's really not. You need to actually open the switch and clean it if you want a long-lasting fix. Um, dripping something in here will work in the short run but the problem is going to come back and it's going to be much worse when it does come back a few months or years down the line and you're just going to have to open it at that point anyway good lord this thing was filthy all right Good enough. Of course, the wipers are completely clean. I'm going to do what I usually do and bend them up just slightly so we get better contact on the switch itself. Drop that back in there. Maybe. Pop this back. Oh, I like to bend these down a little bit in the middle just to give them a little bit more spring. So 
one side soldered down. And the other side, all nice and soldered down. All right, all done with that cleanup. Should be working significantly better now. Why don't we try it out, actually? Pop this battery holder back in here. And look at that. And that actually came out really nicely. I don't see any red, even when I move that real slow. Beautiful. Okay. Enough on that detour. Sorry. All right, all right, all right. Let's get some power usage numbers going, yeah? So this is a 40 pin Game Boy Advance, which in my experience uses a little bit more power than the 32 pin versions. At least stock. Modded, they seem to be about the same which tends to skew the numbers a bit, but unfortunately that's all I have on hand. And where is my Pokemon Emerald? There it is. Right in the overworld at 2.4 volts. Same place as always, same cart. We were pulling about 113, 112 milliamps. And even if we turn the volume up or down, it makes barely any difference within margin of error, so I'll leave it up. All right, now let's try out this new screen here. All right. Here is the PCB. Here is the LCD. And we have two ribbons, 32 pin and 40 pin. Now, if I recall correctly, are those the same on both sides? Oh, okay. That would be unfortunate. It probably doesn't matter, but it's relevant in this case. Um, if you're using the 32 pin, make sure you have the correct side in there. The, well, the other side won't fit, so that's nice only a 30 pin connector it looks like but since we're using the 40 pin I'm gonna pop that in here and the contacts go down not up and this goes in here plug my game back in flip it over this in and there goes nothing so that's one of the things I was afraid of these touch sensors I ran into this on the Game Boy Advance build they're just hypersensitive it's really hard to get any definitive numbers before it's installed without just straight up uninstalling them 
But let's get into the overworld here. And there should be nine levels. That was it. Okay, so at the lowest brightness, it is pulling 222 milliamps at the same voltage. Up one. Looks like it goes up about 10 milliamps, so that's brightness level two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. At highest brightness, it's pulling a whopping 328 milliamps. That's nice. Well, that's not nice. That's kind of terrible. Color palettes, uh, we'll go more into this later again. Uh, don't really affect much as far as power consumption. It will change how the screen looks quite significantly, but there you go. Looks pretty decent. I'm not going to do any um, any like uh, frame dropping tests or anything like that. Not until not until I'm not holding on to the LCD, the bare LCD here. All right. So let's get this actually installed now. So we have, it looks like, two different choices if you want to use an IPS ready shell. We have Funny Playing and Retro 6. Now, of course, you could just trim whatever shell you want. If you want to use OEM, OEM shells almost always result in the best feel. Uh, the trim itself is pretty easy and I have done it before so I'll refer back to one of my older videos. You can check that out. I'll throw a link in, excuse me, I'll throw a link in the description. Uh, in this particular case, I think I'm going to check out the Retro 6 shell and save the funny playing shell for later uh, for one reason and one reason only. I don't want to go find fasteners for this, and the Retro 6 shell comes with fasteners. Uh, I could use my old ones, but they're kind of crusty. And in most cases, that's what I would recommend, but I would only be using a handful of the fasteners, and that's not a fair test. So I'm going to end up testing this one off screen, so sorry if you were looking forward to that video, but that's not quite happening. Uh, real quick, I do want to go over the actual screen bracket itself though. If you're using the Retro 6 shell, the screen goes in here, there's, there's no bracket, there's nothing holding it in. You just kinda gotta shove it in the top right corner and then you can take one of the little rods that it comes with and shove that in the side here to uh, center it if you're that concerned. There's nothing to center it top and down though. The rod that it comes with that normally goes on the bottom has nothing to nothing to sit against down here. If you're using the funny playing shell, on the other hand, you don't even need the bracket. There's these tabs in here. It just drops right in. And it's a little tight because I have this tab sticking out here. The tolerances are very precise, but that'll hold it in nicely. And if you're doing it this way, you don't even need the adhesive. These tabs will hold it in nicely. I'd, I'd recommend at least a little bit to hold it in, but we don't need it. All right, back to here. Um, and of course, if your screen didn't come with these cheap little adhesive brackets, there are still 3D printable options. You don't have to get Retro 6's perfect bracket for that. You just use one of these guys. Drop it in, and it's good. I mean, you still have the up and down problem, but it's no real big deal. So, I guess let's go ahead and let's get going. Good God, this thing is gross. All right. So I'm actually going to switch to a different LCD because this one has a bunch of bubbles in the uh, the film, and I don't plan on removing this film because I'm not doing a permanent install. 
Uh, let me see what I've got here. So I could just use the LG screen, but that's cheating. Let's use this one. This is a Topoli screen. And it should look a little bit better without removing the tab here. Just cutting it off. All right. So here is where if you were doing a permanent install, you would drop in your adhesive. So how this goes, I actually forget which side is which. I think it goes like this. Grab this shell here. I don't know, maybe I had that backwards. Okay, that makes more sense. So you'd peel off the orange part, stick that down in there, and then once it's stuck down, you can just push the uh, middle out. Just give it your thumbs, it'll push the middle out and you can pull that out the front. And then when you're ready to stick the LCD down, you'd peel off the back here. But like I said, I'm not doing a permanent install. We're just doing, just doing something temporary for now. And I'm going to use my 3D printed bracket because this will hold it in on the bottom and I'm going to use a little bit of tape on the bottom. So we want to want to make sure if you're not using a bracket, push it up towards that corner. Just keep it there. If you are using a bracket, push it up towards the top. It should center within the left and the right. But you use a little bit of adhesive here to hold this in. Three little pieces. One, two, three. And this is just cheap double sided tape that came with the SP kit actually. Again, I fully recommend using the actual adhesive gasket that it came with. The single only reason I'm doing this is because I plan on taking this apart in, I don't know, an hour, two hours, give or take. One of the issues that I have already encountered is with this painted Retro 6 shell, the tape doesn't seem to stick very well. But that's quite all right. We can work around that. Ooh, that is not nearly as much tape as I intended to put there. That's okay though. That'll hold it. Just to prevent it from falling out while I'm playing with it. All right, next up. The Retro 6 shell came with a lens here. Um, if you were putting, if you're using the sticky gasket, if you're using the adhesive, you would have peeled that uh, 
that film off the screen and then you'd go ahead and pop on your lens here because otherwise you're going to have a bad time. Otherwise you're going to get um, fingerprints on your screen and you're going to hate yourself for it. I'm not going to apply this lens just yet. Actually, no. I don't see why not. Let's just go for it. I can always pull it off later if I don't like it. Uh, of course, that's not coming off too. Again, this is the lens that the Retro 6 shell came with which I'm pretty sure is cut for an IPS window. There we go. Got to make sure to remove the middle, otherwise what's the point? move on. Let's get this installed. Oh, I think I might actually have problems with this bracket and this PCB. Did not consider that. just barely doesn't fit. There's a little notch on the PCB that needs to be cut off. That's okay. That's part of the reason why I use this bracket in the first place, but rotating this thing because I don't know a good way to oh you know what you shouldn't don't ever push down on the connector like that that is a fantastic way to break the screen you should always lift it up and do it like this even if it's more of a pain in the ass All right. there we go Gonna get a little bit of tape for that. Just some masking tape. Just to prevent this thing from wiggling around. All right. So I'm actually going to put these touch sensors. Where am I gonna put them? I would actually like to put it right there, but my tape is in the way. Hmm. I need it to be just a hair longer. Alright, well, I'll do what I did on the SP then. Since this is double-sided tape, peel that off. I'll just stick this upside down. And I guess that's coming off. The reason upside down is I just want less material in between the, uh, the sensor and 
my finger, I guess. And there's adhesive on the back of these sensors. So if I'm sticking them where there's already adhesive anyway, I might as well just use that adhesive instead. You can see this tape doesn't stick to this shell worth a damn. That's well, unfortunate, but it is what it is. Alright, go ahead and keep assembling here. That's interesting. Don't forget your LED light pipe. Oh, that's unfortunate. I forgot about that. If we want to do... Shoot. Okay. Let's do it. Might as well. Let's wire up the brightness controls. So I was just about to say they should have put the pads a little bit lower so you could solder while it's while the motherboard's in, but it actually doesn't make a difference because the pads you need to solder to are on this side. So I'm going to use the wire it comes with. And I don't remember the specific buttons, so let's try it out. So I just have my multimeter in continuity mode beeps when there's continuity. Um, we want to be careful because these buttons all go to ground. I'm pretty sure the middle pad is a ground here. Nope. It's the outside pads that are ground. So the middle pad is what we want to solder to, which I'm pretty sure is TP2. For start. Nope, TP3 for start. TP2 for select. And then we could do up and down um, or we could do L and R. I think how this kit works, it's not up and down per se. It's just color palettes and then um, brightness. Rotate through all the all the levels there. Hang on just a second. Missed a spot when I was cleaning earlier. All right. So I guess, I don't know. And we do not have to solder the ground. There is a fourth pad for ground here. We only need to do LR and select as it says, but you could do whatever buttons you want. So I guess let's do select, why not? I think I've done the rest of my mods as select. It's nice that they're pre-trimmed. So you don't have to strip the wire, come on. But that is a whole lot of conductor on there. You don't need you need half that much. Okay. 
just results in a much cleaner looking install if your wires aren't hanging off 20 feet before the insulation starts. It's time for new flush cutters. It's been time for a while. I just don't want to abandon them, you know? Okay. So we're going to do it this way. So they're out of here. I have always preferred to use these pins for the shoulder buttons just because it's so much harder to rip those pads. The only thing is, you have to be careful. Oh, let's use the screws it comes with here. How many does it come with? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's an odd number, in more ways than one. That does not seem like the right screw. For that. Well, let's see what happens. Maybe it is. I suspect these screw posts are going to split at some point. Right, just tuck these wires down there. L we're going to put over here regardless of whether it's actually L or not. But we do need to double check because these pins aren't labeled and one of them is ground. So that one. So we need to solder to the far pin on this side. Tin it with some fresh solder. Put that wire in there and trim it now because I forgot to before soldering it. That hit me in the forehead. Kind of spooked me. You do got to be careful with the routing. There are supports on the back here that you make sure you don't want to run it under. Same thing over here. Let's double check which is which. One of these is groomed. Okay, so in both cases we want to solder to the left. Wait, is that, did I get that right? Or did I just get that backwards? No, okay. So left pin, once again, I'm going to trim it first this time. And if you're using the button controls, you can just desolder the, or cut off the touch sensors. Presumably if you're soldering button controls though, you can just desolder touch sensors while you're in there. I guess that's gonna stick to that, that's fine. Don't forget to actually plug this in, because I have done that many times. You get the thing buttoned all the way back up together, only to realize you fucked up, didn't you?
little tight, but no big deal. Worst case scenario, you just gotta plug that in before flipping the motherboard down. All right, home stretch, folks. Oh, there's an extra screw. Comes with 10 screws, not nine. Or was that 11 screws? Oh no, that was 10 screws, okay. Careful not to over tighten them. Won't be the, uh, won't ruin your day, but it's gonna be inconvenient if you strip them out. Oh, wait. I do have an extra screw. So, yeah, there were three that were supposed to go in the motherboard, not two. Oops. it out why don't we looks pretty decent that's annoying oh that's right my battery clip is defective out of the box I forgot about that it is what it is does come with a sticker. Let's pop it on, why not? So we can uh, we can show off how perfect this is. I wonder if these are actually sized right. Probably. All right, here goes nothing. Oof, that was chunky. That does not feel great. That is not better. Okay, it's not that. I'll have to investigate more what that is, but let's try, actually no, let's try out flash cart first. about EverDrive. Oh, I forgot to put the other insulating sticker on. Oh well. Hopefully nothing shorts. So we're gonna run my usual test here. Uh, what we wanna see is every time this S in scrolling crosses the left-hand side of the screen, the ROM is issuing the Game Boy a screen reset command. Uh, so most screen kits, well, at this point, I guess most handle it pretty nicely, but a lot of earlier screen kits didn't handle it very gracefully at all, and it would introduce either some uh, like artifacts or it would drop frames 
or it would introduce screen tearing. And when the reset happens, there is a frame being dropped. That's that's the Game Boy's doing. That there's no avoiding that. When the when the Game Boy issues a screen reset command, it cannot also give the screen another frame. So one's getting dropped. That's just how it is. But what I like showing off with this test in particular is because this test, it's really easy to see if there's any frames being dropped or if there's any screen tearing. And other than when the screen resets, I don't see anything. It looks fantastic to me. So let me go ahead and boot up now. Let's take a look at Legend of Zelda DX. Link's Awakening DX, rather. It's in here, Zelda.gb, so I always forget the name. Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX. Such a long title. Anyway, I like running this test. And if you're coming here after watching my SP video, I'm sorry, I completely forgot to run it. I did run it after I uh, finished the video, but the results didn't surprise me, so I didn't update the video. But anyway, what we're testing here is when I scroll back and forth, we're looking for artifacts on screen. Now this guy's chain right here, this is actually flickering if you see that in the video. On the viewfinder of my camera, it doesn't look like it's flickering. It looks like it's actually having the intended effect, but in person it is flickering. And that is intentional. That means the game, the screen is reproducing the uh, image in the proper way to the full effect because the original game devs didn't have a cheap, um, as in system resources, a cheap way to make transparent sprites. In fact, I just don't think it was even supported on the original Game Boy. So what they did instead is they just made a solid sprite that they turn on and off real quickly, about 60 times a second. Um, well, off 30 times, on 30 times. And that results with the old screens that had terrible pixel response times in a transparent image. Well, this screen has much better pixel response time, so you see the actual flickering and not the transparent effect. Uh, but what we're looking at is the posts on the other screen when I scroll, we're looking to see if there's any artifacts or glitching or any ghosting. And in fact, there is. If you look in the green grass here, you can see quite a bit of glitches there. Now you might have to pause the video and just take a peek for a second and I'll try and post some screenshots in the description there. But it's not terrible. In fact, it's pretty on par with all the other IPS kits that use this screen. So I think it's honestly just a glitch of, or um, a quirk of the LCD itself but it's not terrible despite this being topply. So let's try, let's move on to Game Boy Advance here. Yeah? Cause that's probably what most people care about. Otherwise, why would you be watching a video on a Game Boy Advance screen mod? And yes, there is this little square in the top left here. That's because I didn't pull the film off. But, oh, come on. Every single time. But you can see as I'm running around, if that scrolling bars test wasn't good enough, you can see from here, there's no screen drops, no screen tearing. Looks pretty decent. And I guess let's go ahead and try out the touch sensors. So this left one here is for the color palettes. There should be eight palettes and I'll post pictures. It's the exact same as the Game Boy Advance SP palettes. So I'm not gonna bother taking a whole array of pictures again, but the only one that actually like disables color is this one. This one is just a grayscale. The rest are just filters on top of the existing color. And I don't know specifically what they all are supposed to do, but some of them might look pretty decent. Like, I actually kind of like this one. It makes the game look like, you know, late afternoon, early evening, like it's getting dark out. 
and then we can switch back to the normal palette. And then on the right here we have the brightness, and like I said there's nine levels. But we could also do, what did I do, select, was it start? My buttons don't appear to be doing anything whatsoever. One hour later, not really, but it certainly feels like it. Look at that. They both work. This is why we, um, we test motherboards before just uh, going balls deep in an install like this. Um, it was a problem with the motherboard. I ended up, all it needed was a little bit of, just quickly wiped it down with the cotton swab and there we go. I ended up trying a whole bunch of different pads and I would have varying degrees of success with different ones and you know I'd get one button working but not the other button and oof, oof. anyway so now we have lower upper as far as bright uh, brightness controls this is what the buttons do it would be nice if they added a, um, a second button input uh, so one that I could wire up to start and do L and R to cycle through these pallets you know if we're gonna have them I'd like to be able to use them without having to use touch sensors but there you go and nice thing is this kit does remember brightness settings and oh it looks like it remembers palette settings too I didn't know that Usually they just store the brightness settings without storing the palette. But done with that garbage. Let's do that again. There we go, that matches my shell. So yeah, all in all, this is actually a pretty decent kit. Uh, again, my biggest problem with this is uh, that they just swapped out the LCDs without really saying anything. That just, that seems like such a, that's such a shitty move, I think. Um, I liked it better when they had the LG screens, but like I've, I've shown off those kits before, these ones right here, and you know, with all the frame stuttering and the, and the chop, you know, it just... They're not good kits. These are so much better kits, but the screens that came with these kits are better. So if you have one of these, I mean, maybe swap out the motherboard or swap out the ribbon cable, but leave the screen, you know? Um, otherwise, it's pretty decent, pretty decent kit. I'm liking it so far. I got to play with it a little bit more because I want to actually, I'm actually working on a video regarding this shell and the funny playing shell in particular. And I just, I don't know, I need to play with this a little bit more before I ultimately install it in this shell and play with it here. And, um, I don't know. Shell's all right. If you're getting an IPS cut shell, just keep in mind that there are some quirks with these shells. And you'll have to check out my video for more information because I haven't even checked out this shell yet. I'm, I'm assuming there will be quirks. That's not completely fair of me. There certainly might not be. But at least with the Retro 6 shell, there are quirks. Um, namely, if you want to use any other color power button than what it comes with, good fucking luck. But the buttons themselves are actually pretty decent. I'm pretty happy with them. Uh, anyway, I think that's it for me. If you guys have any questions, feel free to hit me up in the comments. Um, sorry for that huge cut earlier. I just decided that this video didn't need to be almost two hours long, and so I cut out a whole bunch of troubleshooting of this start and select button here. Um, you didn't miss much. I took this thing apart and put it back together about half a dozen times. Shit, about a dozen times in the end of the day. Uh, but anyway, yeah, 
pretty decent kit. I'll throw a link down in the description if you want to pick one up for yourself. Um, as of filming this video, they aren't listed anywhere that I can find, but they should be up on Retro Game Repair Shop at some point. Uh, and at that point, I will throw up a link. Um, thanks again for uh, thanks again to Retro Game Repair Shop for providing this kit in the first place, so I could check it out, uh, play with it, and see what's going on. I'm glad that they finally fixed the button controls and implemented it. You know, thanks to my shifty select button here. But um, you know, it is nice to be able to have that and the touch screen or the touch sensors. Um, but yeah, I don't know. At this point, I'm I'm rambling. I'm tired. I'm gonna go get some food. Catch y'all next time.